Without any further ado, Mr. John Allen reading from his novel, Marmite Cowboy. John! Thank you, John. Thank you, brother. Who the hell is that guy? Uh, sadly, they couldn't afford uh, Statler and uh, whoever the other guy is, so this is Shaw's and Bates we got over here. I'm the autumn in. <laughs> I'm the clarion. <laughs> Take a good look. No, They've got you. an indoor pool. No, thank you. <laughs> now, ignore those guys. This is the thing. I'm not really American, of course. I can't speak like that for very long, so I'm going to give up right now. Hey, up, howdy, how you doing? Thing is, I'm a little. I was a little boy. I was a little boy once in England. All little boys in England wanted to be cowboys. We desperately wanted to be cowboys, and I grew up never losing that desire. So, of course, that's how I ended up in Massachusetts. <laughs> um, but one thing I wonder about you guys, since we grew up watching Gunsmoke and whatever the heck all those shows were called, and we dreamed and dreamed of being cowboys, I have to ask myself, you know, you guys, this, this Downton Abbey phenomenon and masterpiece theatre, did everybody, all little boys and girls here grow up wanting to be an old British fart in a leather chair? <laughs> I just don't get it. Uh, yeah, you got one thing wrong. It's not a novel, it's true. Every stinking word, and some of them do stink quite horribly. Marmite Cowboy. I, I, someone mentioned earlier Marmite. I said, you know, you've won a year's supply. That's one jar for most Americans. <laughs> or a lifetime supply. Uh, the book is about my obsession with America. And they told me I've only got five minutes, so I'm going to get into it right now. Uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to begin with my first glimpse of this great land. The DC-9 made repeated passes over JFK, then began its descent. The pilot had considered the prospect of a night in Montreal, but chose to risk death instead. The visibility through my window was zero, as empty as white noise, until the plane, with a lurch, dipped down through the clouds, revealing my first glimpse of America. Cars crept along a grey and white strip, the Long Island Expressway, like the picture on an old black and white TV with poor reception. The American scene appeared blurry and strafed with static. I squinted through the blizzard at the crawling movie set cars. I was fairly certain that all the people in those cars carried guns and wished to enact their appetites upon young visitors such as myself. From the gangsters of Superfly to the hillbillies of Deliverance, with the art porn of Andy Warhol's factory tossed in, my mind teemed with the sights and sounds of gunplay and sodomy. Perhaps Montreal wouldn't have been so bad after all. <laughs> we landed with a terrifying bang. The engines reversed and roared. The DC-9 crawled to the arrival gate. As I disembarked, scarcely believing I had arrived, I pored over every detail of the bland airport into which I emerged, looking for signs of the magic that I knew America contained. At passport control, I was singled out by a man and woman whose uniforms and facial expressions were starched stiffer than osmium. They took me to a table where my backpack was opened. They searched my belongings, carefully packed to make room for new world acquisitions, casting each item aside in a disordered heap. In monotones, the officers began to question me. What's the reason for your visit to the United States? And how much money are you carrying? Then it happened. They found my letters of introduction, some of which offered me work. In the, they were in the bottom of my pack. I, I don't know why I was carrying them. I didn't need them. And it was because of them that I was deported almost on the spot. <laughs> the male officer who'd taken my letters from the rubber band that held them together began speaking. Some of these letters appear to be offering you work. Are you coming to the United States to work? No, I said. I, I, I don't really want to work. <laughs> I, I, I've got enough trip, enough money for my trip. They're just friendly offers to earn, you know, extra spending money. He frowned. What are you talking about? You think spending money ain't money? You can't earn any money, none at all, zilch, period, got it? The rest of the backpack was strewn across the table. A female officer went through my clothing. She found my money and put it aside with my passport and my return ticket. Meanwhile, the male officer went through the letters. He'd now found a total of three mentioning work. <laughs> Just odd jobs around people's houses, nothing of any real significance, I thought, but I, I knew better than to say so. 
A third officer now joined our group and they all seemed quite excited by their catch. Okay, said the first man, these leathers are a real problem. Got it? If I find one more like these other ones, you're going to have to go back. Got it? Now I was starting to really worry, almost begging them to believe me, promising them that I won't work. I, I won't work at all, I promise you. I couldn't believe this was happening and I knew the letter they were about to read would more than take care of it. I held my breath, wishing the letter into flames as the officer unfolded its pale blue paper. I knew very well what Nidger's uncle Doug had written. It could, it, I could read his vacation houses on the island for next season. He'd pay me $3 an hour, that was 1977, uh, to do as much work as I wanted. I didn't want any goddamn work, and please stop going on about other people on the island who could use some help too. Please shut the hell up. Would you please just shut the, you know what, up? I'd rather, sorry, I'd read the letter 10 or more times as I tried to imagine his island floating out there in the middle of Lake Erie. I, I knew every word, and I watched the officer's eyes move across the page. Here we go, he said. This is a problem. You do appear to be entering the country with the intention of working illegally. We're going to have to send you back. The words didn't really sink in until until he got his walkie-talkie out and started asking if there was a flight leaving for London that night. My dream was imploding, and there was nothing I could do about it. America didn't want me. I was even less welcome than the old ladies who used our backside outside toilet when they were shopping down in the village. The female officer was a tough-looking brute, her starched uniform packed as tightly as any village matriarch's corsets. She she hadn't said much, but her stern manner had alarmed me from the get-go. She was worse looking than any of the male officers. The storm had caused the cancellation of all flights to London, and the officers were huddled some yards away, mumbling, trying to figure out where they could put me for the night. She broke ranks and approached me. You should know that you have the right to an appeal. What, I responded, from my hypertrance. I'm informing you that you have the right to ask for an appeal. You have the right to appeal our decision to deport you. At which point she went on to explain, after I asked her, what do I do? She says, you just need to shout now that I want to appeal. So I shouted, I want an appeal! Felt like Nelson Mandela arriving at uh, JFK. Anyway, that's all I've got time for right now. The book is absolutely filthy. There are chapters with names like Gland of Opportunity, which is why I can't really read a lot of it here right now. But if you want a copy, you want a copy, you know where to find me. Well, if you don't, someone will tell you. Wait, is, is Marmite the planet you're from? <laughs> That's right, Mr. Shaw's Motel. Will, will a piece of it kill you? <laughs> Only if you eat it. Am, am I having another stroke? I cannot understand a word he is saying. Yeah, speak English for crying out loud. Excuse me, excuse me, but we loaned you this language and look what you did with it.